stand. Every woman, man, and child would stand out of respect for the office. And so because he is our God and he is our Savior and we reverence him as the Lord of heaven, we stand for a moment for the reading of God's word. Can you say amen? amen. I'm going to be reading in your hearing this morning out of the book of Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 25. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. We're going to read down to verse 29. When you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, just look to our left and to our right of the screens to the left and the right of our stage, and there those scriptures will be conveniently provided for you. Amen? See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised. I'm getting some feedback through here. There's conversation going on somewhere in the building and it's feeding back through the speakers. If you guys could fix that. Uh, Once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. Yeah, since you're getting something that ain't going to move. Yeah, let's be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence, with awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Drop back to verse 26 and 27 because that's, that's where I'm going to be putting my thought at. Once more, God says, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Good Lord. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And I'm going to use a simple subject this morning. I'm shaken, but I'm not disturbed. Yeah, look at somebody and say, I'm shaken, but I'm not disturbed. Bless your word on this morning, God. Use me to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I'm shaken, but I'm not disturbed. I think that earthquakes are perhaps the most dangerous of all natural disasters. That's my opinion, and I'll tell you why. Because a tornado or a hurricane, you can, be, you can avoid that by going underground. I'm from Dallas, Texas, in this part of Tornado Alley. And when tornadoes tear through that region, you can typically escape it by going underground. You feel what I'm saying? You can get to a storm shelter and escape it. And, and a flood, as bad as it is, if, if you seek high enough ground, you can avoid it, right? If there's a flood coming and you get enough warning, if you go up high enough, eventually the water is going to stop. It's going to recede. It's not going to go any higher. So if a wind comes through, I can get underground. And if the flood comes through, I can seek higher ground. But where do you go when the earth is shaking? Where can you go? Going underground is not going to escape it. Going higher is not going to shake, not going to escape it. Where do you go when the very ground beneath your feet is shaking? Right? So, so let me talk about earthquakes just a little, just a little bit. How, how do earthquakes occur? Well, first of all, all an earthquake is, 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 is things that are shaking or shaking or vibrations on the earth's surface that is due to plates or platelets that are, sh- that are moving underneath the earth. Underneath the earth, underneath the earth's crust, there are platelets that are moving all over the world. And when those platelets rub against each other and they move, it causes vibrations and shakings on top of the earth. And that's what we call earthquakes. What am I saying? I'm saying there are shifts in the invisible that affect what is visible. You with me this morning? You awake? There's something underground that's shifting, that's moving, that's causing vibrations and shakings on the surface. Even when we talk about tsunamis, tsunamis, those great waves, those great tidal waves, they are simply created by underground earthquakes. There are shifts underneath the Earth's crust that are causing vibrations on the Earth's surface. And so what you're experiencing above ground is because of the result of something that's happening underground. You with me? Look at somebody say, it's an earthquake. It's a shaking. 
So, so in our text, what Paul does is he refers to an experience that Israel had when they had escaped from Egypt and they had gathered around Mount Sinai in the wilderness. Three months they had traveled from Egypt to Mount Sinai. This was the place that God had commanded Moses, bring my people out here to worship me at the mountain. I want to have a meeting with them. Here was the God who had delivered them from Egypt, who had brought them through the Red Sea, who had led them out the leadership of Moses, but they never met him face to face. And God says, Moses, bring my people out here. I want to have a meeting. Bring them to Mount Sinai. We're going to have a meeting. This is in Exodus chapter 19, if you want to research it. And so here they are. They're gathered around the mountain, and God, the God of glory, the Bible says he came down on the mountain of Sinai, and he came down like it was a furnace. Yeah, he came down with smoke and fire and lightnings. He came down with trumpets. So here was the God that they had heard about, heard talked about, who had brought them out, but they never seen him. And now this is their first, first face-to-face meeting with the God of heaven. And he came down with all this bombastic, this fire, this smoke. It was so awe-inspiring. It was so frightening that it scared the people to death, quite frankly. <laughs> Everybody talking about, I want to see God face to face. But seeing God face to face and seeing him come down on that mountain, it was um, frightening. <laughs> it was scary. And here was God coming down. And when he came down, he told Moses to tell the people, I want you to put boundaries around the mountain and tell the people, don't go past this boundary. Don't go past here. And always he said, look, I want you to respect me. You're not going to treat me any kind of way. So he came down and put boundaries around and put limits around and said, don't touch this mountain. And if you go beyond this mountain and assume and presume to come into my presence without being invited into my presence, I'm going to break forth on you. I'm going to bring judgment on you. Don't, don't disrespect me and just assume you can treat me any kind of way and handle me any kind of way. I am the God of heaven. I am the God that brought you out. I will be respected. And if I put boundaries and borders around something, I want you to respect it. And they knew he meant it. <laughs> they knew if God put ropes around this, don't touch it. I think that's one of the things that's missing in church today. There is no respect for God. There's no respect for the things of God. That if God put boundaries and borders in place, that many people have lost their fear of God. And we are too presumptuous when it comes to the things of God, the holy things, the things that are set aside. That if God says don't touch, we don't care about the word or instruction being given to us. We're going to touch it anyway. Yeah, I'm going to leave it alone. So the author says in our text, if they didn't escape judgment... When they were warned on earth, in other words, Moses told them, don't go past this boundary. God said, don't go past this. If you do, there's going to be judgment. If they respected it, right, if they knew that judgment was coming because of the word of a man, how shall we escape if we refuse to respect him who speaks from heaven? In other words, let me put it in modern vernacular. If a man will tell you, you can't come in this door, you'll respect it. Because you're afraid of judgment or consequences. And if you can respect the man for giving you rules, your boss tells you where you can't go, the police officer tells you where you can't drive, the government tells you what you cannot do. If you can respect the man, how about God who speaks from heaven? And quite frankly, many of us have more respect for men than we do for God. That if a man tells you to do something or tells you you can't have something, we immediately respect that request. Last week we talked about authority and abuse of authority and uh, uh, submitting to authority. Many people who will respect a man standing in front of you, but will not respect God, who is the God of heaven, who speaks to you. Oh, my God. So what he's saying is that when God is speaking to you, don't play him off. Don't blow him off. That when God is saying something to you, you don't, don't just pass him off and say, well, I'll get around to it. Well, I'll do whatever I want to do. God said, when I'm saying something to you, I want you to respect it. And the challenge with many of us is that when God is speaking to you, you don't respect it. You don't respect it. You blow him off. You play him off. And that's part of the problem, even in churches, that we don't respect God's word anymore. I'll share this with you because I've shared this before. Because here it is. It's the tenor in God's voice that gets your attention. I'll share this with you because, because I've shared this testimony in this church. When God first called me to ministry, I tried to play him off. 
<laughs> I made excuses. I didn't know what it was. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I didn't know exactly what God was calling me to do. I just knew as a new Christian that God was calling me into his service. Some people think they have to know everything that God's going to call you to do before you go, but you don't. I just knew that God was calling me into service, that God was calling me away from a lifestyle, and he wanted me to submit to service, submit to my church, submit to my pastor. And so every so many months, Mark, I would go back to God and say, you sure? <laughs> this is the conversation me and God would have. Are you sure? And I'd go around for a little while again, and we'd go through this for months and months and months where God is trying to say, Derek, I want you to do this, and I'd come back with excuses and reasons why, my background, my past, I'm scared, whatever my reasons were. And, 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 and one day I heard God say this to me in my spirit, and it wasn't what he said, it was how he said it that got my attention. I'm, pre I'm questioning God in my prayer time, and I'm saying, God, are you sure you want me to do this? And I heard God speak and say, I want you to do this, and I don't want to say this to you again. It wasn't what he said, Mark. It was how he said it. It was the tenor. It was the tone. It was the position that he took with me that made me know he ain't playing. It reminds me of my mama. When my mama got mad at me and he want, she wanted me to do something, she would take the, where my mama's at in here, where my parents at in here. You know how it is when your mama tell you to do something and she's serious about it and she'll say, you better do this and I'm not playing. Clean this room up and I mean it, right? <laughs> my mom had a way of saying that where you knew that if you didn't, it was that tenor, it was that tone that she took that you knew that the next thing was going to come was a shoe, <laughs> The next thing going to come was judgment. The it wasn't going to be no more talking. The next thing was going to come was a belt because I told you to do this and I'm not playing with you. And some of y'all don't understand that when God is talking, he ain't playing with you. It was the tenor, the tone which he took that let God let me know that he's not playing. And some of you right now, God is trying to say certain things to you. And he's having this back and forth argument with you about obeying his word and obeying his will. And you're having this excuse and this party and this argument with him about the will of God for your life. And you're making excuses that you don't know everything. You don't have to know everything God wants to do. You just got to obey the next step. That obedience is just obeying the next step. Something about the way God spoke to me said, let me get on in here and call my pastor. <laughs> let him know I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to submit to the ministry. I'm going to get involved in the church and all that sort of thing. Because God, I knew instinctively God wasn't playing with me. See, when you refuse to hear the spoken word, when you refuse to hear the preached word, God has a way of talking to you through your circumstances. How many of you know what I'm saying? That sometimes you'll hear the word preached and you'll play it off. And sometimes God will put a word in your spirit and you'll pass it off. But God has a way of getting your attention. If he can't talk to you through his word, he will talk to you through your circumstances. That God knows how to get your attention. That God knows what things to shake, to move, to manipulate, to make you say uncle. And for somebody in here, I can't get off of this. For somebody in here, God's been talking to you for a long time about your life, about your lifestyle, about your decisions and you've been playing him off and saying I'll get to it I get around to it and God said to tell you I'm not playing with you I mean it look at somebody say he means it God doesn't waste breath he's not like some of these modern parents today who will threaten you a thousand times but you ain't gonna do nothing see my mama if she said something and she said it more than once your head was gonna get knocked off <laughs> she, she wasn't like these kids I see in the supermarket now that fall out in the aisle and kick because they want some cookies and their mama said no. So their little Johnny stretched out in the supermarket with his feet kicking like a roach till he get what he want. My mom would have snatched you up. <laughs> I know, that's my mama. That's not your mama. It wouldn't have been no more than no one time. So, so, so if a mama could do that, how about God who is speaking to you and saying, I need this from you, and you're trying to play him off. Look at somebody say, don't play him off. So when we refuse to hear the spoken word, where God speaks through circumstances. So the verse says this. It says, at that time, when they gathered around the mountain and God came down in the smoke, he, he came down in the smoke, he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. This was going to be the commandments that was going to set the tenor for this relationship. This was a covenant. I'm, I'm, I am God. I'm telling you, I want you to do these things. And if you're going to have relationship with me, you are being commanded to do these things. So he came down in the form of smoke and 
and fire and lightning. And look at this. And at that time, God's voice shook the earth. It shook the earth. When God came down, it literally shook the whole mountain. The voice of the Lord spoke so strongly that it shook the entire mountain. Now, now understand this. Anytime you see a mountain in scriptures, it's symbolic of immovable things. When you see a mountain in scripture, it speaks of things that are sustainable, things that are unmovable, things that are steady, that are stable, that will not move. That's what a mountain symbolizes. But when God spoke, it moved things that wouldn't normally move. That's why Jesus said to us as believers that if you if you if you if you have enough faith and you speak to the mountain, that you can say to the mountain, be moved and it will be so. He was saying, I want you to walk in your God voice. Some of you right now, you're facing some immovable things. Some things that have stood up in your life like a mountain. And God said, I want you to speak to that thing in your God voice and command that thing to move. You're dealing with economic situations, financial situations, marital situations. You're dealing with things in your family with your kids. And they're standing up in them like it will not be moved. And God said, if you have enough faith, you can speak to that mountain and it will move. See, here's part of the problem. Like I told you, earthquakes are caused by something underground that that moves something above the ground. So the problem is when you're speaking to your mountain, you're speaking to the physical thing, and what you need to do is speak to the thing behind the thing. You're speaking to the mountain, but you need to speak to the spirit behind the mountain. Oh my God. You, you, you're, you're just speaking to what's standing in front of you. There's a spirit behind that financial crisis. There's a spirit behind what's going on in your marriage right now. There's a spirit behind what's happening with your kids. The peer pressure, the issues, the problems. You're trying to speak to the kid, but God wants you to speak to the spirit behind the kid. And if you speak to the spirit behind the thing, the mountain will move. Oh my God. Oh my God. I, no, I, I'm already preaching, but you're not listening to me. The problem is you're wasting breath hollering at the issue and somebody said well Lord I've been speaking to the mountain for a long time and it's not done anything do you not know that things are true in the spirit before they're true in the natural when I see things moving on the surface that's because something is shifting underneath you need to speak to the spirit of that thing I want to challenge somebody right now whatever mountain is standing up in your life and refuses to move I dare you by faith to stand up on your feet and point to that thing and say you will move I'm telling you it will move I speak against that spirit of poverty it will move I speak against this confusion in my house it will move I speak against that spirit that's trying to mess up my his life. I speak to the spirit of that thing and command it to move in Jesus' name. You don't have no faith. That's why you didn't even do it. Some of y'all just stared at me like a TV screen, but I want you to open your mouth and begin to tell that thing to move. Whatever your thing is, whatever your mountain is. How many folks got a mountain right now? You, no, you ain't got no mountain. You got some things standing up right now that refuse to move. My money won't move. This health situation won't move. I've been back and forth to the doctor. My blood pressure refused to come down, but I speak to that spirit right now and command it to move. I arrest it in the Holy Ghost right now, and it will move. Everybody that knows it, shout, it will move. Oh, you don't believe it. You don't believe it. I want you to prophesy to somebody standing next to you right now and say, it will move. I don't know what your mountain is. I don't know what your issue is. It might have been there for a long time. It may have been in your family for generations, but this generational curse will move. I command it to move. Poverty, you got to move. High blood pressure, you got to move. Depression, you got to move. I speak to the spirit of that thing, and I command it to move. Oh, find somebody else by faith and say, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it. If you shift the thing behind the thing, that mountain will move. Somebody give God 30 seconds of praise if you sense in the Holy Ghost. Oh, I sense something. I sense something in this room about to shift. The devil said it ain't going to happen, but I just spoke to the spirit of that thing, and it will move. It will Speak in your God voice. You trying to speak in yourself, in your flesh, but you got to speak in your God voice. If God can speak to a mountain and the whole thing shake, now God says as his children, you speak to your mountain and the whole thing will shake. Oh, I can't get happy yet. I can't get happy yet. Sit down. I can't get happy yet. 
The, the unseen things affect the seen things. It's the invisible things that affect the visible things. If it moves in the natural, if it moves at all, it's because it has already moved in the spiritual. And what you see working out in the natural is a manifestation of what has already occurred in the spirit. I know what I'm talking about. If you get resources, it is because something has broken in you, in your spirit. There are things that have to break on the inside before they manifest on the outside. And sometimes when people see you, they don't want to let you have joy or be excited about what God is doing. But they don't know you've been doing spiritual warfare for a long time. Don't, don't hate on me because I'm blessed. I was wrestling for this in the spirit. You don't, you don't know how long I prayed for this. You don't know how many nights I had to walk the floor for this. You don't know how many days I had to hold on to the horns of the altar for this. Don't hate on my blessing because you don't know what I had to go through to have this. Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about. You don't know how many sleepless nights I went through and how many times I had to believe God for crazy things and how many times I had to walk through criticism. So let me have my day. Every blessed person in here, give God a praise if you are laugh for what God has done. Take a moment and give him praise. Some of y'all owe God a praise. You ain't gonna praise him no better than that after all the stuff you came through, after all the stuff you done survived, after all the things God brought you out of. You ain't got no better praise than that. Take 30 seconds and give it to him right here. So, yeah. So I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to get out of your way. I'm going to, get way. I'm going to talk about the reality. I'm going to talk about the removal. And I'm going to talk about the remaining. And then I'm going to get out of the way. All right? Write this down. Number one. He says, I will shake heaven and earth. Just like I shook the mountain before Israel. And I shook everything and made them afraid and made them be all inspired. I'm going to this time, this time, this time. I'm not just going to shake earth. I'm going to shake heaven. That's what he promises. In other words, when you speak of earth, earth speaks of natural things. Heaven speaks of spiritual things. So when God says, I'm not just going to shake the earth, not just the natural things, I'm going to shake things in the spirit realm. I, the voice of the Lord, I'm going to shake everything. Shaking is going to be everywhere. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken. I'm going to shake everything. That's the reality. According to the National Earthquake Information Center, there are an average of 20,000 earthquakes a year. 20,000. You don't always feel them. You don't hear them being reported on the news. You don't hear them being talked about. Most of them are no more than tremors. Some of them you don't hear anything about. But 20,000 earthquakes are happening even as we speak. Even if you don't know it's happening, it's happening. And see, why am I bringing it up? Because I want you to understand that this is where people get confused and they think it's strange because earthquakes are happening all the time. They're happening all around you. They're happening in all different kinds of places. And when it comes to God, people, when they go through shakings in their life, they think something strange. And Paul said, don't think it'd be a strange thing when fiery trials come upon you as though some strange thing has happened. This is normal. This is what messes people up about marriage. You run into a challenge, run into an issue, and you think it's only you. But in actuality, this is normal. That every relationship goes through shaking. That every life goes through shaking. Whatever you go after, there's going to be a period where it's going to be shaking. And before life is over, everything your life in your life will be shaken. Everything in your life will be tested. Everything you know around you, everything around you will be tried. You're seeing it everywhere. We're experiencing the shaking in heaven and in earth everywhere. What am I saying? I'm saying that institutions that we knew to be stable and solid and unmovable are now being shaken. How many know what I'm saying? The, the institutions are being shaken. That laws long-standing laws are being shaken. Some of you, your friendships are being shaken. People that you knew you could count on. Friends that you knew. I mean, you were friends from the sandbox. Those relationships are being shaken. How many know what I'm talking about? That their family members, people that you knew had your back, relationships are being shaken. Policies, churches, oh my God, are being shaken. Y'all don't believe that. 
That that shaking is normal. That shaking is happening everywhere because God said, I'm going to shake heaven and earth. Nothing is going to escape it. Everybody's going to experience it. It's going to happen everywhere in churches, in leadership. Leaders are being shaken. People that were long-standing, stalwart, steady, solid people. You're starting to see things in their life where they're being inconsistent, mm, unreliable. Uh, People that you knew you could count on to be there are suddenly finding fickle reasons for not being available to you that sometimes they do and sometimes they don't and sometimes you can count on them and sometimes you can't you know what's happening God is shaking things don't be mad at the persons or the people or the institutions this is not something that happened just because the Democrats took over it's going to shake if the Democrats have it it's going to shake if the Republicans have it it's just going to shake because God said I'm shaking heaven and earth oh my God oh my God I submit to you that you shouldn't trust anything that hasn't been tried yet I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that you shouldn't trust anybody that hasn't been tried yet. You have to be careful. Some of you are chasing after people, for example, trying to get information to, uh, uh, to, trying to figure out ways to make your marriage work, and you're following people that have just been married three months. No disrespect. I'm glad that you're happy. I'm glad you had your destination wedding. I'm glad that you met your boo, and you might teach a class about how to get a boo, but you can't teach me how to maintain a marriage yet because you ain't done that yet. I ain't getting no amens. I ain't getting no amens. And you chase not the people who have not had their lives tried yet. After you buried some people, after you've been through financial crisis, after you've had to help somebody who's sick, after you buried a parent, then come talk to me. But don't talk to me when you're just getting off your destination wedding. <clears throat> Stop getting mentors who have not been tried yet. Stop tracing people whose words have not been proven yet. Oh, oh my God. I was watching on the internet the other day on YouTube, and this guy was on there, and he's he supposed to be really, really, like, Mark, he's supposed to be really, really uh, uh, popular. That's the word. Popular, uh, telling people how to maintain relationships and marriages, how to work and function, and all that kind of he's, he's going in. He's going in. He's saying really good stuff. All the stuff he's saying is really good. And, and the guy that was interviewing him finally said, well, sir, I mean, no disrespect, he said, but you're giving all this great advice. He said, but you ain't married. <laughs> and you ain't never been married. <laughs> no disrespect, right? And they said, well, they said, well, I don't need to be married. Or I don't need to be married. I don't need to go through that to tell people what to do. I can just tell people that. No, 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 sir. I respect what you're saying and everything you're saying is right. But come back to me after you've been through something. I'm not saying what you're saying is not right. But what I'm saying is it has more credibility when it's been proven. Come on, somebody. Why is it that somebody who ain't ever raised kids going to try to tell you how to raise your kid? Come on now. Wait till you've had to go through the terrible twos and the terrible threes. And wait till you have to go through the preteens and the teen years. And then come back and tell me how to raise successful kids. But don't tell me how to raise successful kids. And your baby's six months old. No disrespect. Come on. I'm not telling right. No disrespect. Because when you say something, it has no credibility. It's not that it hasn't, it's not right. It just hasn't been proven. And so every once in a while, God will prove and test everything that you rely on. And everything you profess, everything you trust in, everything you confess out of your mouth, God said it has to be tested in order for it to be proven. Come on, somebody. And I'm going to tell you, write this down. If you want to know where the testing is going to be at, where the enemy is going to test you, he's going to test you in the area of commitment. If you want to know where your attack is, it's going to be in the areas of your commitment. The greatest battles I've ever had have been between what I know and what I actually feel. Between what I know to do and what I feel like I want to do. How many know what I'm talking about? Between what I know is right and between what I feel like I want to do. And all of you are going to be tested in this area. Everywhere you made the greatest commitment, that's where the enemy is going to contest you the most. I tell leaders when they step into leadership, I said, be careful. And I want to forewarn you that the moment you say yes to this position, that the enemy is going to attack you. The moment you commit to it, the moment you commit to being over anything or involved in anything, that's when all of a sudden all kind of strange things are going to come up in your life. 
All of a sudden, all of a sudden, the moment you say, yes, I will be over the willing to do committee, everything is going to go wrong. Murphy's law, Murphy's law is in full effect. Everything is going to happen. It's going to happen in your marriage. It's going to happen in your money. It's going to happen in your body. It's going to happen on your job. You're going to see people that were stable and solid start being shaken. The job will start being shaken. Your body will start being shaken. I know what I'm talking about. Because every time you commit to something, the enemy has to try you, test you. And it's not always tempting you with bad things. Sometimes the enemy tests you with good things. Come on, somebody. When the devil tempted Jesus, he said, Jesus, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. What was wrong with having all the kingdoms of the world? It wasn't time. It wasn't time for that. It wasn't the place for you. And some of you, it won't be where God will tempt you with doing something wrong. Sometimes the enemy will tempt you to be out of season. He will tempt you to have something at the wrong time. He will tempt you to have somebody at the wrong time. It's a good job, but it's not my time yet. God has given me an assignment, and it's a good position, and there's more money and all that, but that's not my assignment. And the enemy's going to test you in the areas of your commitment. The moment you commit to your church, the moment you commit to your God, the moment you commit to the calling on your life, all of a sudden everything's going to go crazy because he has to test you in the areas of your commitment. I was telling somebody, I was having a conversation with them, and they were talking about going to church and showing up. And I was telling them, I said, listen, sometimes just showing up is a ministry. Just showing up. Because when people come to church, they start looking for certain people at church. These people have become pillars. They're familiar faces. And when they walk in the room and they see familiar people there, they calm down. You know what I'm saying? It's like, there's Mark. Yeah, there's Carmen. And you may not know him or know him personally, but I scan the room and I look for familiar faces. And when I see those solid people, those solid deacons and ministers and certain people that just there, it gives me a certain amount of calm and ease. And so even in this church, I tell people, even if you're not a leader, show up because your presence is a ministry. When the sheep walk in and you start, when, whenever you walk into an organization and you start seeing top people being moved out, it makes you uneasy. Think about your job. When you walk in and you start seeing the VP, the vice VP, the executives, all the upper management people, it starts making everybody else nervous like what's going on. So even in a church, when you walk in, the first thing we do is start looking for familiar faces. And even if you're not up front preaching or teaching, just your presence is a ministry to somebody who's watching. And by watching you as a consistent person, as a solid person, when I see you, I calm down. It's all right. Things may be shaking, but it's not going to go down because Daphne's still here. Mark's still here. So-and-so is still here. So what the enemy does is he goes after solid people. He goes after stalwart people. He goes after familiar people because he knows if I can shake them, it's going to shake the people that follow them. Oh, y'all not, not with me this morning. He, he knows if I can shake Daphne loose, everybody connected to Daphne is going to be shaken. So he starts going after solid people who have made a commitment. So if you're wondering why the devil is giving you excuses and making up all kinds of things to keep you out of church, it's because he knows somebody's depending on you. Y'all not going to talk to me. Somebody walked in today, and when they didn't see certain people, it made them nervous. It made them un uncomfortable. It made them wonder what in the world is going on. Where's Sally? Where's Mary? That is a trick of the enemy. It's a tactic of the enemy. So he starts picking out certain people one by one because he knows if I get Mark, I'm going to get everybody connected to Mark. Y'all not going to talk to me this morning. So he's going to shake it. He's going to shake your house. He's going to shake your finances. And so you have people who are in leadership or in influential positions who are suddenly coming up with crazy excuses for not being in place. Oh, my dog ate my cat. I can't make it. Oh, my toe hurt. I can't come. Oh, my favorite show is on. I can't make it. <laughs> oh, you know, as long as God's handing out blessings and favor and opportunity, they were there. But when the life starts shaking and the devil will shake your life, when things start shaking in your house, it keeps you from being committed to your God. But if you're going to be somebody who serves the Lord, you've got to be like David and say, I will bless the Lord at all times. 
I ain't got no people like that in here. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Don't think that I came here because I didn't have nothing shaken. It was shaken, but I wasn't disturbed. I learned how to praise him through a storm, Daphne. I learned how to praise him while my finances were shaking. I learned how to praise him while my marriage was shaking. I learned how to praise him while my kids were going through. You think you're the only one going through marital crisis? You think you're the only one that got kids that's showing off? We came anyway. Somebody's got to anyhow praise. Give God a praise right here. I said give him a praise right here. Hallelujah. Immature people have to have everything right before they come. And everything got to be right. And every I got to be dotted. And every T got to be crossed. And if I feel good and my weight is down and my hair is all right, then I go to church. But there are some people who are determined through hell and high water, I will come, I will serve, I will be there. Why? Because I'm committed. I'm committed. I'm committed. Sometimes having too many options is not good for you. <laughs> when you have too many options, it messes you up, Mark. See, 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 when I only had one option, I could be committed to one thing. I only had one option. It's when you got several options that your relationships are committed. Y'all, y'all looking at me funny. Y'all looking at me funny. When you have the option of whether to watch it online or in person, that's when it becomes a struggle. <laughs> when you have the option of doing other things and being in other situations rather than be here, the devil is going to tempt you in the areas of your commitment. And that's normal. That's the reality. So don't think it's strange. I'm leaving the impact church because there's an earthquake over there. And I'm going to go over to this church, First Baptist. And then you find out there's an earthquake over there. So I'm going to go to so-and-so Pentecostal church. And there's a storm and an earthquake over there. Pretty soon you realize there's earthquakes are everywhere. You just got to be the kind of person that can lean on something and hold on to the storm pass. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It will pass. When the shaking stops, I'll still be here. What we need in church, Daphne, are people who are committed enough to stand through an earthquake. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. I've only been in about one or two in my life, Mark. And what I realized that you hold on to something solid and you just ride it out. Some of you, you would have a long-standing marriage if you learned how to ride it out. See, if you get out of this relationship because it's an earthquake, you're going to get in another relationship and it's going to have an earthquake. Then you get out of that and you get with somebody else and they're going to have an earthquake. Why? Because earthquakes are normal. That's reality. If you decide to go to school and get your degree, you ain't going to just slide through. You're going to have earthquake interruptions, things that go wrong, things that go crazy. That's life. That's the reality. Oh, God. Are y'all with me so far? Let me prove it to you. When, when, when the devil was talking about to God about Job, he said, Job, he said, Lord, you know what, God? The only reason why Job is serving you is because you got a hedge around him. He got everything going for him. Cute wife, obedient kids. Hey, Amen. He got respect in the community. He got money. He said, God took that hedge around him. He would curse you to your face. That's the challenge. And that's the challenge of many of us today. As long as things are going right, I can count on you to serve God. I can count on you. I can count on you to be there. I can count on you to show up. But the moment things go wrong, that's when you start peeing people lack in their commitment. Because you're not there because everything went the way you wanted. The people that are in this room, look around this room. The people that are walking in this room today, they had to step over something to get here. They had to step over something to stay here. And if you're going to be the kind of person who has a successful marriage or a ministry or relationship or raise kids, you can't be somebody that bowed out just because you got an earthquake. Everybody's got an earthquake. Look around. Everybody in here's got an earthquake somewhere. But you have to be the kind of person that will stand there and wait. And let me tell you something. It does stop. <laughs> I want to talk to somebody about when the shaking stops. It does stop. It's not a permanent earthquake. It's not a permanent problem. It's just a moment. It's just a season. And if you can withstand the season, you'll be able to get to the blessing. Oh, my God. 
Oh, my God. I wish we'd have some people who would get up and start teaching us how to stay married instead of spending hours and hours trying to tell us how to get married. I got the get married part down. I'm trying to figure out how to. Y'all not going to talk to me. You, you, you know, it's a different skill set to get somebody, Charlene, than it is to keep somebody. I wish I had some mature folks in this church. It's, it's, it, you can start a ministry. The question is, can you keep a ministry? You can start a business, go on out there, get your LLC and start something. But the idea is, can you keep the business going? That's what we need people to teach us. I need some people who've been through something, been there, done that, had got a t-shirt, and I want to give you the microphone. If that's you, holler at your boy, because I done been through something. Through so the whole thing, Job held on to his integrity, and he remained, here's the word, consistent. Can you be consistent while your life is shaking? Can you be consistent? You went after you decided to go to school and things went wrong with your financial aid and the teacher don't like you and all kind of things are happening. But can you be consistent? I'll never forget, I was trying to finish my degree. I was working on my bachelor's degree, trying to complete. I was a few hours away from finishing, and I had a major earthquake hit my house. I mean, major. I mean, it took me out, knocked me in my, hit me in my belly, and I thought, oh, God, I can't finish. And I called a friend of mine and said, you know what? God, help me cancel my classes. I'm going to be out. And this is what they told me, and it blessed me so much, and it helps me to this day. They said, Pastor, life is going to always happen. Life is going to keep happening. If you're going to quit every time a storm comes, you'll never finish your degree. It's going to always be something. Life is going to keep happening. And I come to tell somebody who's in leadership, who's a mother, who's a wife, who's a leader, life keeps happening. And if you're going to quit every time something hits you, you'll never do anything. You'll never be anything because life is going to keep on happening. Pastor, I got to quit because my dog ate my cat. I'll come back after I get. No, you got to be the kind of person that says, you know what? I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to be reliable. Look at somebody and say, be consistent. There's nothing worse than relying on somebody who is inconsistent. There is nothing worse than having to worry and wonder if they got it. I got leaders in this church that I rely on deeply, and I don't even worry about whether something is done. It doesn't even cross my mind. I already know they got that. They're taking care of that. They're going to, take, they're going to be on top of that. I'm not going to have to worry about that. And there's nothing worse than having to wonder in the back of your mind, I wonder if somebody did something. I wonder if something, 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 something. I don't pick the songs in this church. I don't worry about the music. I don't worry about the signs that go out in the parking lot. I don't be in the back of the kitchen cooking the biscuits. I don't worry because we got people that take care of those things. I don't worry about certain things because certain people I know, but I'll tell you what is aggravating is to give somebody something and you don't know if they're going to do it or not it is frustrating and so when God talks to you it is frustrating for God to wonder if you're going to show up or not if I send you into that job it's concerning that he's not sure if you're going to represent him or not and you wonder why God doesn't bless you in certain areas because he can't trust you Oh, yo, yo, I'm trying to help somebody here. I would release more into your life, but I can't depend on the fact that you'll be there. I'm not sure if you're going to do it or not. You want to know how to have God bless you? Be a consistent giver. God, I'm not going to invest in nobody that ain't going to do what I tell them to do. I'm not going to give it to you when I can't trust you to do the right thing with it. Come on, somebody. Number two, let's talk about the removal. Because he said, this indicates the removing of what can be shaken, right? So what I'll say is this, some things in your life shouldn't move. We all have shaking periods. We all have unstable periods. But certain things about your life should not move. Your prayer life shouldn't move. Your study in the Word shouldn't move. Your praise shouldn't move. There, there are certain things about your walk that even though my job may change, my spouse may change, my friends may change, but my faith will not change. There are some people that if something happens in the leadership in their church, they leave the church. You know why? Because their faith is built in a man and not in God. Come on, somebody. The game may change. The players may change, but the game doesn't change because God is still God. 
<sighs> and you're so tied into a person that if that person moves, there goes your faith. And God said, sometimes I shook people out of your life because I want you to take your eyes off of them and put them on me. Some of y'all grown people, you grown now. You still hanging out with your parents like you a kid. You a grown person. And God says, I want to be your mother and your father. Y'all not going to talk to me. And so what I'll do is I will shake that relationship to prove to you that it's not sustainable. That the only constant in my life, in your life, is me. Let me show you what I mean. It, it, when an earthquake occurs in regular buildings, it shakes the building so much that it causes, get this, structural damage, right? If an earthquake hit this building, it would move beams, it would move columns, it would move walls, it would move braces, and if it shakes enough, they will render this building non-functional, meaning that it has been shaken so bad that it could fall apart at any time. So if you go to cities like California, where they have earthquakes a lot, they build those buildings to withstand earthquakes. They build into it, get this flexibility. Yeah, they build those buildings in such a way that they sway without collapsing. God said to tell somebody that in this season, it's going to be important that you be flexible. That, oh, <laughs> you're praying that the, that the shaking don't come. I've already told you the shaking is coming, but God's trying to put in you the ability to be flexible. Yeah, well, the earthquake may hit your marriage, but it's flexible enough that it doesn't crack under pressure. Oh, my God. Some of you got visions of grandeur, of going into ministry, and God can't release you because you're too rigid. You don't realize that you're going to run through earthquakes, so I can't trust you with it because the first time something don't go your way, you're going to get an attitude and get mad and walk out. But I need you to be flexible enough to know when to hold your peace and when to speak up, to know how to bend and how to turn and how how to change and how to move positions without cracking under pressure, without blowing out the door, without blowing up the spot. God said, I'm trying to make you flexible. Look at somebody say, be flexible. Yeah. Some people can't go forward in ministry because when God gives you something to do, you latch on to it. You're going to be rigid. You're not going to change. You're not going to move or anything. But God said, I want you to be flexible in this season. You might have to, you might have to take down on what's happening in your marriage. You might just have to say, pick your battles. There it is. You have to pick your battles. That some things you're just not going to argue about. That some things going to say, you know what, I'm going to let you make it. Come on, come on, somebody. Some of you that's on your job right now, you have a habit of always giving somebody everything on your mind, giving them a piece of your mind, keeping it 100, and you're going to be 100% broke because you don't know how to be flexible. Flexible flexible. When the earthquake hits, my building moves and it sways and I don't break and I don't collapse and I don't shatter because God has put in me the ability to be flexible. Somebody say, be flexible. flexible. Last thing and I'm going to be done. I want to talk about the remaining. He says, so that the shaking comes, so that what cannot be shaken can remain. What am I saying to you? There's a purpose in the shaking. That if God is allowing your money your marriage, your kids, your ministry, everything that you rely on, if God is allowing it to be shaken, there's a reason. Write this down. Don't make decisions until the dust settles. I'm preaching better than y'all responding. <laughs> I ain't hooping yet. He ain't hit the organ yet. Because I'm trying to put something in your spirit, right? Write that down. Don't make decisions until the dust settles. Some of you are jumping in relationships and out of relationships, and you haven't even assessed what's happened before you jump into something else. Before the dust has settled, before you figured out what went wrong and what's going on with you and what needs to be. When, when buildings go through uh, an earthquake, they go in with teams and they do an assessment of the structure. They got to assess what made it, what didn't make it, what was strong, what was weak. They got to assess the whole building before we go forward. And some of you are trying to build on things before you do an assessment. What went wrong? What did I do wrong? What could I have done better? So you have to wait until the dust settles before you start making decisions. And you're trying to make permanent decisions based on temporary circumstances. Oh, God. I'm preaching up in here. Lord have mercy. Y'all looking at me. Is there a movie playing up here or something? <laughs> the 
there's a purpose in your shaking. And part of it is to shake out the stuff you don't need. Some of the shaking is to shake people out of your life you don't need. Some of the shaking is to shake out attitudes that you carry that you don't need. You can't take this attitude to the next level of glory. So God said, let me shake it out here. Because if I don't shake it out here, it's going to mess up what you're getting there. Oh, my God. You can't take your ghetto attitude into the president's office and be the vice president. It don't work here. Ooh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There are certain things that God has to correct. God has to shake out. Everything that's attached to you now can't go where you're going. Don't get nervous when you don't see certain people because for where you're going, they couldn't go. Oh, oh my God. Look at somebody say they couldn't go. They couldn't go. Don't be upset. Don't let the devil say, well, where's so-and-so? They couldn't go. Some of y'all old enough remember this. My mother, she used to take the rugs off the floor and take them outside. Shake it out. My grandmother, before that, she would take the rug and put it over the clothesline and beat it. That's how they got the dust out, Daphne. They beat it, and all this dust would go to flying because they beat it. But when they put it back on the floor, it was released from all the impurities and all those things that was in the rug. God said, don't get nervous when you feel like your life is being beaten. And your life is being shaken. Oh, my God. Daphne, I don't know. And your life is being shaken. Some of you right now, your life is being shaken. And it's being beaten. And you think it's a sign you're with the wrong people in the wrong church. Sometimes God is beating your life to shake some things out of you. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to knock some things out of you. So I got to put you up on this clothesline and beat your tail because you can't take that attitude. You can't take that anger. You can't take that lust. You can't take that. For where I'm taking you, we got to beat some stuff out of you. But don't get nervous because whatever you lost, you didn't need it. I lost some friends, Charlene, but I didn't need them. I lost some opportunities, but I didn't need them. There were some opportunities, Daphne, if I took it, it would have killed me. And so God said no, and it hurt my feelings, but I knew that if I took it, it was going to be bad for me. How many of you are mature enough to thank God for the things that you lost? I mean, you, you shouting over the stuff you kept. I'm thanking God over the stuff I lost. I'm thanking God for the, there are some things you're holding on to that are keeping you from being what you're supposed to be. There are some things that you're clinging to desperately that God said, I'm trying to get it off you. I'm trying to get it off you. So here's my clue to you. Stop calling them. Sermon's over. I'm done. Hit the organ. Where the drummer at? Stop calling them. You calling them and mad at them and talking about they unfriended me and they don't want to be connected to me. Stop calling them. Because whoever left you, you wasn't supposed to have them in the first place. I've been working with you for years to get you out of that circle. I shook your life. Because I knew you wouldn't do it, Carmen. I knew you had too much heart. I knew you were too kind to let them go. So I sent an earthquake to shake them out of your life. And you started seeing them disappear. You want to run back and get them. And God said, leave them alone. I did it on purpose. Where are my people here? Your life is going through a shaking right now. My life is going through a shaking. My money is going through a shaking. My mind is going through a shaking. My relationships are going through a shaking. They're shaking on my job. They're shaking in my community. They're shaking in my church. It's shaking in my family. But God said, don't worry. When you come out of this, everything that's left of the things that are supposed to remain, everything that's standing couldn't be shaken. <laughs> Sharina, here's the issue. It's not that it won't be shaken. It's not that it can't be shaken, but it couldn't be removed because it couldn't be removed. It couldn't be. It couldn't be. So every once in a while, the shaking is coming through because God is trying to see, I'm going to see how you are 
under pressure. You running around here, breaking your heel, jumping up and down, talking about I'll never take it back. I love the Lord. And God said, I'm going to send you through a shaking because I'm going to see. And so here's how God does it. I know you praise me with your big fine car. I don't know if you'll praise me on the bus. See, if you're going to do it right, you got to be the same person that will praise God whether you're a based or a bound, whether you're up or down, whether you feel good or not. And I want the same kind of person who's praising me in a fine house to praise me if I'm in an apartment. Let me tell you something. The praise you see is the same praise I gave God when I didn't have a car. I was praising him on the bus. I was praising him in an efficiency apartment. I was laid up in a hospital bed, but I was still giving God a praise. I was praising him when I was single and you gotta praise God when you're married and if you get single again you gotta still praise God. You're not gonna talk to me. You're not gonna talk to me. I praised him when they thanked me. I praised him when they didn't. I praised him when he didn't have no support and I praised him when I did. Look at somebody say I'm consistent in my prayer. I will bless the Lord at all times. So, so here's what I want. I want all the consistent praisers in here to give me a demonstration for some of these immature individuals who don't know how to go through this next day. Take 30 seconds and show them how you praise God anyhow. Anyhow. This is how you do it. Anyhow. Show up for the fight. Anyhow, show up on the job. Anyhow, show up for duty. Anyhow, show up for church. Anyhow. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> you don't know me. Somebody better ask somebody. I feel like Paul. Paul said this way. He said, I was troubled on every side, but I'm not distressed. I was perplexed. I was confused, but I'm not in despair. I was persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I was cast down, but I'm not destroyed. I've had problems. I've had issues, but God is still God. I ain't got no real praisers in here. I ain't got no real. Where the real praisers at? Where the real praisers at? Where the real praisers identify yourself? The same God that brought me through last year will bring me through this year. High five somebody and say I'm still here. High five somebody and say I'm still here. All my survivors in the room. troubles get you down somebody we won't have church in a minute as soon as I get you out your flesh and get you over in your spirit and recognize that I'm still here I lost some stuff but I'm still here still got my praise still got my joy I went through a fire but I still got my joy I went through a flood but I still got my dance is there anybody in here somebody say yeah say yeah say yeah somebody I 
Look here. It's a proven fact that people who have been successful at something that they built or created, say a business, they can lose the entire business and they can build another one that is just as successful or more successful because they've learned certain principles that work. You follow what I'm saying? When you give people instant success, for example, it's a proven fact that people who have instant wealth, like people who win the lottery, statistics say in a matter of three to five years, they end up in bankruptcy because having more money don't change your life if you don't have certain principles. Come on with me. There are certain things that you have to learn along the way. That's why the Bible said that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. It's not the quantum leaps. It's the steps, the step-by-step -step process. And every step you take, God has to test it. Every step you take, you have to adjust your weight before you make the next step. If you were going up a flight of stairs, you have to take a step and then adjust and then take another step and adjust and take another step and adjust somebody take a step with me god said on this level i'm gonna help you adjust before you take another step take another step with me i'm on my way to something i'm not there yet but i'm on my way take another step i ain't got my credit together yet but i'm on my way take another step i ain't met my boaz yet but i'm on my way take another step i ain't raised these kids yet but i'm on my way take another you're not gonna step with me you're not gonna step with me i'm not what i used to be but i'm not gonna gonna be i'm gonna take a step put on someone say take a step take a step take a step don't let the devil discourage you because you're not there yet you gotta take a step and every step you take you gotta adjust you gotta get your balance you gotta adjust your weight before you take another step don't be in such a hurry it's a step the steps of a good man are ordered by the lord look at somebody say step by step step by step Now I'm going to give you the secret and I'm going to sit down. The secret to going up is every step you take, you praise God for that step. I'm going home. Y'all don't want to have church. I said for every step you take, you thank God for that step. How many can look back over your life and see things God brought you through and you may not be where you want to be, but I thank God that my life is not like it used to be. Thank God for this step right here. You ain't gonna praise him. I said, thank God. Before I do another thing, you gotta thank me for the last thing. Clap your hands and give God a praise. Oh yeah. been through an earthquake but I'm still standing I thank God that I didn't lose everything I didn't lose everything Carmen I didn't lose everything thank you, Father. so this is what you gotta do you gotta thank God and learn how to praise him on the broken pieces when your life gets broken up, you gotta thank God for the pieces that are left. So do this for me. Shake somebody by the hand and tell them, neighbor. Come on, shake them by the hand. We testify today. Tell them, neighbor, I just come to tell you, this is what you gotta do with what you got left. You gotta praise him like you lost your mind. Somebody. Somebody! Somebody! Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, I'm Pastor Derek Faison. 
and I am the lead pastor for the Impact Church of Nashville. I just want to say how glad I am that you have stopped by our YouTube channel. You're going to find some great material on this channel. It's going to help you and challenge you in your walk with God. Keep coming back. Make sure you subscribe. Share as many videos as you like. This vehicle is what we've chosen to be the place where we could continue to do discipleship, mentoring, training, and teaching. Also, you'll be able to keep up with any place I'm speaking around the country, around the city, or around the world. So make sure you subscribe. Make sure you subscribe and share with your friends. I just want to welcome you again to our YouTube channel.